Welcome back. And we have another, we, I'm sure we're going to have another exciting session, just like, if not better than the, first, the previous one, um, because all our, we have an anthropologist, which is a very interesting species. <laughs> and, uh, and we have a sociologist in the first panel, so that's it, make everything exciting. And we have political scientists and law. Law can be exciting too sometimes. Um, so we will, we will talk about, um, which are a little bit related to the previous one, even though it's not the right way. Uh, we we'll talk about transnational marriage and family dynamics. We, I'm sure we have very exciting uh, papers. Um, in, in terms of a cross marriage, cross border marriage uh, in the past, um, we have about every year, average 380,000 um, foreign spouses from out of Taiwan. And the trend is two trends. One is south, south to north, which Tang Wong Hui, Dr. Tang Wong Hui talk about from Vietnam, Philippine, Philippines, and much less uh, Indonesia, and those Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia to Northeast Asia. And the other one is west to east. That's from China. In terms of research, this panel has played its role because in the past research, in terms of the two waves, uh, the south north world research is much more, uh, uh, more and uh, less politically sensitive. And in terms of a Chinese bride, Chinese legal marriage to not uh, to Taiwan is much less studied. And we should explore why, and I know why but I'm not going to tell you now. <laughs> um, but they will tell you, uh, probably. So it's interesting to fill the gap of this cross-border marriage. And it would be very good for to compare with the, the other aspect of the cross-national boundary, uh, cross-border marriage. But in terms of number, I'm sure the paper will tell you. Actually, from China to Taiwan, that portion of cross-border marriage, cross-national marriage, is much more, more than 60%, but yet less studied. That make this panel mysterious and interesting. So who will, who will solve the puzzles? Uh, we have two paper presenters and three discussants. Um, let me just introduce you briefly to start with uh, Dr. Sarah Freeman on my left. Let's give a call. Oh, you don't do that. We do, sociologist. Um, she's an anthropologist from the Department of Anthropology, Indiana University, Bloomington. And she will talk about engendering immigrant struggles, family formation across the Taiwan Strait. And second presenter is Bruce, Dr. Bruce Liao, Liao Yuan Hao. And she's a law professor. She teaches in National Zhengzhi University. She, uh, he will talk about second class immigrants, third class citizens, how does, tai how does Taiwan law define or treat mainland uh, spouses? Very interesting. Usually fly, a flight like, like sim sim similar to the flight, right? Yeah, first class, second class, and, and economy. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> so we have a three discussion on my right. First one is Yang Wen Yuan Wen Ying. She teaches in the uh, uh, Department of Political Science, National Zhengzhi University. She will be our first discussion. And second discussion is Chen Zhao Ru, right there. She is a law uh, specialist, Department of Law, National Taiwan University. And the third one, Antonio Zhao, Zhao Yanling, on the far right. She is a sociologist. She has actually one of the few who started uh, this uh, uh, mainland spouses study. Uh, unfortunately, she uh, couldn't present the paper, but she will serve a grand discussion. Mm -hmm. um, the grand discussion means after the two discussions, she will wrap up and, and make a comment on the discussion. <laughs> right? Isn't that right? <laughs> OK, so uh, we have very, we look forward to it. And first, let me introduce, let me welcome uh, Professor Freeman, and she will have a 17 minutes.
my goodness. You all hear me? Okay. All this technology. So my title, as you can see, has changed slightly uh, to reflect my paper. I want to talk just briefly first about how I came to study this topic of cross-strait marriages. Um, and I have two points of entry here. One was an interest in finding a way to study the what I think of as the lived experience of cross-strait relations. So again, aptly our title of our conference, Below the Storm, looking at what it means for people who are living these political tensions um, in the context of their everyday lives and especially in the context of their intimate relationships and family relationships. And then moving from this is a second, perhaps more disciplinary and, and theoretical concern with what the very unusual political relationship between China and Taiwan, especially the uncertain sovereign status of Taiwan, can tell us about um, approaches and understandings of citizenship and national identity in the contemporary world. Um, and here I'm thinking about citizenship not merely as a formal status, although that's certainly important, having it or not having it, but also as everyday practices of belonging and identification and how that works in a context of uh, some rather long-standing conflicts and contradictions. So uh, this project I began um, in roughly 2003, and the bulk of the research I conducted between 2007 and 2009. And uh, the project involved um, considerable interviews and field work with Chinese spouses in Taiwan and their family members, both in Taiwan and in China. Um, and it, I also did some interviews with cross-strait couples who live in the mainland. I also have worked considerably with um, different NGOs in Taiwan, both those that provide services for Chinese spouses and those that engage in struggles for greater immigrant rights in Taiwan. And then finally, an important piece of the project has also been research with officials and bureaucrats in relevant government offices in Taiwan, especially the Mainland Affairs Council, the main policy body, and the National Immigration Agency. So my paper today grows out of an interest in how immigration and naturalization policies treat and produce individuals who move across borders as specifically gendered subjects. And here I'm going to deviate a little bit from some of the assumptions that came across in yesterday's papers about uh, shared ethnic and cultural and social similarities across the straits. I'm here I'm going to point out actually considerable differences uh, in gender role expectations and gender ideologies. So um, we heard a little bit about marriages with Southeast Asian spouses um, in the previous panel. And here I'm going to be talking about Chinese spouses who represent the largest number of foreign um, spouses, marital immigrants to Taiwan, both in terms of absolute numbers and in terms of a percentage. Um, you can see from this table, which has quite a lot of data in it, that the, num the um, percentage of all registered marriages in Taiwan involving one non-Taiwanese spouse peaked in 2003 um, at roughly 32 percent, and it declined to a low of 14 percent in 2008. And of these cross-border marriages, marriages with Chinese spouses account for about 60 percent of those. Um, by the end of 2009, there were a little over 274,000 mainland spouses who had applied to enter Taiwan, and a little over 75,000, or 27 percent, who had received Taiwanese citizenship. And I should add that in absolute numbers, there are more foreign spouses, Southeast Asian spouses, who have naturalized than Chinese spouses. So I'm interested here in the gendered tensions that are inherent in a marital path to citizenship for Chinese spouses in Taiwan. I argue that immigration and naturalization policies reflect assumptions about cultural values and family forms that obscure critical differences in gender socialization and ideologies on both sides of the strait. I'm interested in how state policies and mainstream societal norms interact with immigrants' own subjective experiences and personal goals 
to create gendered tensions in social interactions, family relations, and also bureaucratic encounters. Um, and so in the larger paper, I do this through looking at various groups of Chinese spouses and how they negotiate these tensions in their marital relationships and in their everyday encounters. My argument is that marital immigration policies intersect with patrilineal family norms to create a dependency model that channels Chinese spouses into reproductive roles premised on feminized domesticity and care work. Immigration policies define Chinese spouses as kin dependents whose claim to legal residence and naturalization in Taiwan derives almost exclusively from their marital relationship. Um, and really offers them no independent basis for making a claim um, of belonging in Taiwan. At the same time, Chinese marital immigrants also encounter policies and local gender norms that emphasize their reproductive contributions and care work over productive labor. And a desire to engage in remunerated work is often perceived as casting suspicions on their marital motives. I want to just briefly set the stage by oh, giving you a brief overview of the immigration and naturalization policies that Chinese spouses face in Taiwan. Um, I figured if I left this in Chinese, that would be fine. So <laughs> excuse, apologies to those. Um, this is the old, now the very, very old, the old, old system that was in place that basically had three and then four stages um, to uh, naturalization. Um, the most longest, the longest one being the tanqin or visiting relative stage, which is a very uncertain, unstable stage. Um, prior to uh, 2000, the, prior to 2004, at the tanqin stage, Chinese spouses could only stay for about six months out of every year, and then they had to go back to China, and they had their Taiwan spouse had to do the paperwork for them to come back. So they had very little. Um, claims to any kind of independent status or resources in Taiwan. Um, the overall time frame I should add here is roughly eight years, although the existence of a very complicated quota system could make that slightly longer or sometimes slightly shorter in certain circumstances, especially because the quotas gradually changed over the years as the government adjusted them. This is the so-called new system that was instituted um, in March 2004. Um, and this did away with the six months in Taiwan, six months in China system. Spouses came um, and immediately received what's called reunion or tuanju status, um, which could be renewed uh, for up to two years. They did not have to leave the country. After two years of marriage um, or the birth of a child, they could then receive kin dependent residency. Um, at that stage, there are certain conditions under which they could apply for a work permit. These conditions were gradually expanded over time, but work permits were not granted automatically. Four years at the kin dependent stage, um, you were then eligible for extended residence, uh, often sometimes called permanent residence, but still your status in Taiwan was dependent on your marital the continuation of a marital relationship, so not like a U.S. green card, for instance. Um, and only at the extended residence stage, Changqi Julio, could you automatically receive work rights. And then two years at Changqi Julio brings you to Dingju, which is the equivalent of naturalization. That's a whole other topic, the language that's used for Chinese naturalizing as opposed to foreigners. Um, in August of last year, new revisions to this regime were put into place that eliminated that initial tuanju stage. So now, after passing an immigration interview, you can immediately apply for Yichin status, and work rights have now been opened up at that stage. So that's a pretty significant shift that has happened under um, the Ma Ying-jeou administration. So that reduces the total time frame now to six years. And the government also, in January 2009, eliminated the quota for naturalization, so there's no longer a bottleneck, a waiting period that had built up now for almost as long as a year at that stage. So in thinking about this um, dependency model, basically these immigration stages um, assume that a Chinese spouse remains married and remains married to the same person for the entire pre-naturalization period. Um, during that time, their citizen spouse wields a great deal of power 
as their guarantor, and there are similarities here with the um, Vietnamese spouses um, that were discussed earlier. If the marriage ends, in most cases, their only recourse to remain in Taiwan is if they can successfully receive child custody of a minor child um, and transfer their kin-dependent status from their spouse to that child. Um, so this means that for the long eight, now six years it takes to become a Taiwan citizen, Chinese spouses can only maintain legal status through their marital relationship primarily. Um, and they never have any independent basis for claiming a relationship with the state over that period. Now, since we've all been hearing voices, I thought it would be helpful to show a little video about how um, some of these gendered assumptions about a dependent reproductive model um, rooted in a patrilineal family emerge in uh, government promotional materials. And what I'd like to do is show you a video um, put out by the Mainland Affairs Council uh, just this past June. And this video um, was intended to uh, garner support for the government's efforts to reform policies, especially the opening up of work rights, about which there has been a fair bit of contention here. Um, what I'm interested in is how they make that claim by rooting these women even more firmly in their patrilineal families in Taiwan. Okay, so. I hope the sound works on this. This is Lan Tai Wan Gina. This is Gina Mama. Then 贵企的没价值的套路他们都是台湾人的妈妈。新时代台湾人,好像天堂之西郎。And the voiceover in that, by the way, is uh, Lai Xingyuan. Um, so obviously there's really rich material in this video for analysis, and I'm not going to have time to go into all of it. Um, but what I do want to talk about is how in making these claims for opening up work rights, which is a, a positive thing, um, the video also reinforces a dependent model of marital immigration. Um, it presents the legitimate family as exclusively patrilineal. A mainland wife marries into her husband's family, Jake, bearing children and often co-residing with his parents. This rigid definition of the desirable family also denies legitimacy to other family forms, um, including those that mirror this model but in which the Chinese spouse is male, which is another interesting dimension. Um, and also conspicuously absent are a much more contentious group of Chinese wives, older women, um, who are married, most many of them, to um, elderly veterans. And these caretaking marriages often dominate negative media portrayals of Chinese spouses, and they're the subject of attention and concern by immigration bureaucrats. Um, so the one caretaking marriage that's portrayed in the video is very interesting, precisely because on the surface it seems to work against some of those negative stereotypes, right? The, the wife is younger. It appears in the video as if she has actually born a child with her elderly husband, although his weak physical state means makes that somewhat questionable. Um, however, their actual family composition looks very different. The child does not belong to this couple, but was born to the woman, Leo's younger sister, who also married a veteran. Both birth parents, the sister and the brother-in-law, suffer from mental illness. 
um, and were unable to care for the child. And one of Leo's motivations for marrying a Taiwanese was to help take care of her sister and her sister's child. In making that decision, she left behind her own young son um, in China. And subsequent conflicts over the years with her ex-husband resulted in her son's virtual abandonment by his father. And this story was actually featured prominently in the newspaper as well. Uh, desperate to resolve her son's plight and obligated to support her sister and nephew, Liu, together with other Chinese spouses and NGO activists, petitioned um, officials to relax restrictions on mainland spouses sponsoring minor birth children left behind in China to come to Taiwan and, and obtain residency and ultimately citizenship. And these policies were revised in June of last year, and Leo was able to bring her son to Taiwan last July. So what's interesting is that in this video, there's no mention of Leo's much more complex family responsibilities and the extent to which her particular family is not based solely in Taiwan, but extends across the strait. Her sister's earlier marriage to a retired veteran and subsequent birth of a child, mental illness, Leo's own divorce and custody dispute in China, all create the foundation for a family composition that includes natal family members and their descendants, her child from a previous marriage in China, and her current elderly husband in Taiwan. And Leo, in an interview, explicitly articulated this broader family model um, in a way that deviated quite considerably from the patrilineally defined family that's idealized in the video and the portrayal of a Chinese spouse's primary commitments as limited to husbands, conjugal kin, and Taiwanese children. So her family obligations span the strait, they encompass natal and conjugal relatives, and they include both Taiwanese and mainland children. And this family composition challenges a reductionist vision that defines her in traditional terms as wife and mother. Equally important are her roles as sister, aunt, and financial supporter of diverse kin networks. Um, now, not all families are as complex as hers, um, but in my many interviews with Chinese spouses and their Taiwanese family members, I was struck by how consistently their family composition and obligations in both Taiwan and China deviated from this idealized vision portrayed in the video. And so with this complexity in mind, we might view this dependency model um, as more of a, a desired outcome of immigration policies rather than a fait accompli. So although immigration policies certainly induce very concrete regulatory effects, they also reflect aspirational and educational goals on the part of the government how to produce these desirable families at a time when, as Shelley mentioned, Taiwan is facing historically low rates of marriage and childbirth among its native population, and importantly for my paper, um, how to educate Chinese spouses in the kinds of gender dispositions that are necessary to fulfill primarily domestic roles as mother and wife. Um, I'm not going to have time, obviously, to go into the details of that, but you can look at my paper for descriptions of how different groups of women really um, deal with that issue. And just in closing, I want to say briefly that, um, and, and this is a reference back to uh, Tang Wenhui's paper in the previous panel, um, this notion of authentic marriages premised on a dependency and caretaking model um, is not obviously not unique to Chinese spouses. There are similar tensions in marriages with Vietnamese um, and in marital immigration laws in other countries. But I do think there's something specific about how gender struggles figure in the immig immigration trajectories of Chinese spouses in Taiwan, both because of their more complicated sequence of immigration and naturalization stages and because they simultaneously represent the presumed comforts of ethnic and culture similitude and threatening political difference. So conflicts over gender ideologies and gender roles constitute an important means through which these political concerns may legitimately be expressed and potentially neutralized. Um, and one of the ways this happens is by defining Chinese marital immigrants as kin dependents who are embedded in patrilineal families thereby deflecting political tensions onto the ostensibly less consequential terrain of gender ideology. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Freeman, and um, followed by uh, Dr. Liao. Please, Mike.
Okay, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is Bruce Liao. Um, uh, my, 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 the title of my paper is Second Class Immigrants, Third Class Citizens, How Does How and Law Define Mainland Spouses? And I, I, the, the motivation for me to write this article is that uh, I, I hope that this is simply a starting point to elaborate the political and legal status of mainland spouses in Taiwan. Because we, I, though we, we already have more than 250,000 mainland spouses living in this island, and more than 70,000 uh, 70, of them have got the Taiwan citizenship, that is national ID card. They, legally speaking, they have been treated, they should be treated as uh, Taiwan citizens. For instance, they can vote. They can reside in this island permanently. They pay taxes. They were bound, bound by law. However, they were treated as second-class immigrants and third-class citizens. The uh, more ironically thing is that, you know, in terms of our constitution, the constitution of the Republic of China, the ROC constitution, in fact, the all mainland spouses as well as all mainland Chinese are citizens, citizens of the Republic of China. They are ROC citizens. However, they are not Taiwan citizens. That's a weird situation. And the ROC citizenship cannot guarantee anything for them. So it's a very weird situation. I hope that uh, the, uh, the, the, the legal circles and the political science circles that can elaborate this more. And uh, this is a simply a starting point. I hope to just uh, review, uh, reveal this point and to discover that uh, th th this is a, a very weird situation in which we cannot use the traditional legal theory, especially constitutional theory, to explain that. And uh, the other example is that you know, when, uh, just because the, there are some discrepancies between the treatment of, uh, treatment, legal treatment of mainland spouses and the Taiwan citizens, uh, native born Taiwan citizens and uh, foreign spouses. Many, um, basically, uh, it's fair to say that the, the legal treatment of the mainland spouses are l far less favorably than the, the treatment of foreign spouses. So they are less than foreigners, less than aliens. And that's why many mainland spouses, when they were in the streets, uh, take part in the demonstrations, the parade, they claim that we support Taiwan independence, because if Taiwan were an independent country, we were foreigners, we were foreign spouses. We don't want to be so-called mainland spouses. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean anything to us. Uh, so uh, that's the situation right now. And then, okay, we can see the, the, the first, uh, we can go to the constitution of the Republic of China. Uh, mainland spouses' constitutional status, how the our ROC constitution says about them. We must, we must note that the constitution of the Republic of China, ROC constitution was enacted in 1946 when the KMT still governed the whole China. And uh, this constitution has governed the whole China, literally, the territory of the Republic of China has not been changed, literally. Why? Because we have uh, Article 4, and the Article 4 defined the territory of the Republic of China, and uh, it provides that uh, any alteration of the territory must uh, have the resolution made by the National Assembly, but the National Assembly and the legislature has not made no such resolution yet. So literally, we have the, we, the, the, the ROC still cover the whole mainland, Chinese, Ch mainland China. And uh, therefore, all mainland Chinese have been ROC citizens. The Article, four, Article 2 of the Constitution provides that all citizens are sovereign of this country. And uh, Article 3 provides that who could be the citizen of the Republic of China? Anyone with the ROC nationality. And who could have the nation, ROC nationality? It, it largely left it to our Nationality Act. The Nationality Act before 2000 provides that anyone whose father is a Chinese could be an ROC citizen. So therefore, you can, think of, you, you can imagine the situation. Virtually all mainland Chinese uh, 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 and uh, mainland spouses, they are, their father are Chinese. <laughs> and, uh, they therefore are ROC citizens. So literally, they are ROC citizens. OK, 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Who can help me to, to do this one? Okay. Okay, that's the. And uh, after, uh, since 1990s, uh, the, the Taiwan government was facing the weird situation because before 1990, uh, with the Taiwan just uh, just uh, defined the mainland China as a uh, as a rebellion, so we don't need to discuss with them. We just uh, pretend that they 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 are governed by the rebellion. However, after 1990, they must uh, communicate with each other, so they must uh, uh, be facing the new situation. So uh, we enact a, a series of uh, amendments to the RC Constitution, make a new situation, make a new structure that is. We have the, the, the RSD territory could be divided into mainland area and the so-called free area. Free area means Taiwan area. And the mainland area of the RSC territory means mainland China. And the free area of RSC territory means Taiwan. And the old government power just uh, could, could exercise, uh, could be exercised in, just in the free area. Yeah, why? <laughs> That's not my point. <laughs> you want to save time? <laughs> okay. Then, <laughs> with respect to the citizenship of mainland Chinese, especially mainland spouses, we can see the RC citizens could be also could also be divided into people of the mainland area and the people of the free area. The people of the free people of the free area means the Taiwan people are the real citizens of Taiwan. Uh, the definition is that if you have the household registration Huji in Taiwan, then you are the people of the free area. They are real Taiwan citizens. They can, en they can enter Taiwan territory without the permission. They can vote. Uh, they can, now we, we can vote. Uh, we, can, we have full fledged protection of the laws. However, the other kind, the other group of ROC citizens, the people of the mainland area, they have household registration in mainland. Therefore, they could be treated like foreigners by law. That's the, that, 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 that's the 11th Amendment provide that. So that's 2.2 group of Taiwan uh, uh, ROC citizens. Then mainland spouses, uh, uh, then we, next we, we talk about uh, mainland spouses status in Taiwan. First, the mainland spouses, they are mainland Chinese. So first, they are IOC citizens, but not the Taiwan citizens. They could be treated differently from people of Taiwan area. That is, they could be treated like foreigners. Then people of Taiwan area are real Taiwan citizens. And how to, how to tell, how to distinguish Taiwan people from the mainland people? The household registration location would be very important. Neither domicile nor real residency is the det determining factor. That is, even you reside in Taiwan very long. However, if your ho household registration is in China, the, uh, in mainland China, then you will be deemed uh, people of mainland area, not the people of Taiwan. So the household registration will be very important. It's a proxy of the citizenship. Uh, we can say that. And uh, in addition to be a mainland Chinese, we know that mainland spouses have a, uh, in my view, they must have a different status. That is, they are Western aliens or mainland immigrants in Taiwan. That is, yes, they are aliens. Uh, cool. Uh, they are mainland Chinese. However, they are living in this island. They are the they are the father of Taiwanese. Uh, they are the uh, the wife or husband of Taiwanese. That's the that's the dependence model mentioned in Sarah's article. So they have some affiliation with Taiwan. They they are different from they, they should be treated dif treated differently from other mainland Chinese. Therefore, well, I think that uh, they must be treated differently from. Uh, the general, uh, the ordinary mainland Chinese. The first uh, uh, hint is that the Bill of Rights of the ROC Constitution protects every people without regard to nationality, citizenship, or, or alienage. So we cannot say that because you are not a Taiwan citizen, so the Constitution uh, provides no protection to you. 
The first, the second thing is that I think that we could have three kind of models to dealing with the, the immigrants. The how should the constitution treat immigration, immigrants or resident aliens? The first the model is so-called the contract model. Contract model means that because all immigrants are, were voluntarily going to this country, then our laws are, are very similar to the term of contract. You chose to come to this country to be bound by the law, so you should not complain about the, the harshness of the law because you voluntarily accepted that. That's a so-called contract model. The affiliation model put much emphasis on the affiliation that if this immigrant or this alien has the close rela relationship with this host country, then we must uh, treat you as differently, uh, like more similar to our citizens. The transition model means that uh, not only you are a um, connected alien, but you are a transitional citizen. In the future, or immediate future, you will be our citizen. So we must uh, treat you as a tra transitional model. In my view, that the mainland spouses in this island are largely consistent with the model two and model three, because most of them uh, will likely be a Taiwan citizen. Uh, so. Um, they must be protected as Taiwanese. So I think mainland spouses must be treated as, as these quasi-citizens or semi-citizens or transitional citizens. In addition, uh, non-discrimination among foreigners as the international constitutional principle must be applied. That is, you can discriminate against the aliens. You can make some distinction between aliens and their nationals or citizens. However, you should not make further discrimination or distinction among foreigners. Uh, that, that, uh, at least that you should not be get worse treatment than other foreigners. I think that's their status. So mainland spouses, they are mainland Chinese, but they are mainland immigrants in Taiwan. That's the theory. However, in Taiwan, in terms of uh, our positive laws, that's another story. That is our law treat them as uh, foreigners. Uh, first, uh, we can see that uh, they are maybe they are quasi foreigners or worse. The legal ground to create this kind of second class citizens is the first, the Eleventh Amendment up to the Constitution. The Eleventh Amendment provides that it, uh, any, we can make law to make distinction. Uh, uh, between, uh, distinct, uh, between the mainland area people and the Taiwan people. The other, uh, more important, is the outer governing relation between people of the Taiwan area and the mainland area, the Liang An Guan Xi Tiao Li. And uh, we may say that the, the act uh, could be defined as a special immigra immigration law regarding or against mainland Chinese. That's a special immigration law. And uh, according to the act, uh, I mean the Liang Guan Xi Tiao Li, the act, before those uh, mainland spouses have uh, been transferred or naturalized into Taiwanese status, uh, we have various uh, kinds of restrictions on their rights. Um, they, they, they will not be treated like uh, citizens because we have entry regulation must apply for entry. We have borderline after entry interviews. Uh, they, they must uh, be uh, uh, fingerprinted they are subject to deportation. They could be de under custody. Uh, they can put in detention before deportation. All of them like, uh, are like, very like foreigners in general. That's the, that's the treatment of foreigners, not citizens. Uh, not citizens. So it's, it's a point that they, were not, they have not been treated as citizens. And if you, they want to apply for the Taiwan citizenship, becoming the, Taiwan, the people of the Taiwan area or the free area, uh, uh, as Sarah introduced, uh, they must uh, pass uh, through several stages. According to the current revised law, uh, the first stage is spouse residence, each in Julio, uh, four years since entry. The second stage is long-term residency, uh, the, m at least the two years. The third stage uh, is permanent residence. If they are allowed to have permanent residency, they are allowed to have household registration in Taiwan, then you got the Taiwan citizenship, literally. However, even they got the Taiwan citizenship or the national ID card, they will be treated as a so-called second-class citizen or probationary citizen, in my, uh, in my words. Uh, because, uh, for instance, we have some law 
the Article 21 of the Act provides that ex mainland people, that is, you, you were a mainland people, is not entitled to any public office in 10 years since getting household registration. That is, even you got the household registration in Taiwan, you can vote, but you, you, you are not allowed to be any public office, anyone, even a very tiny, very low, low rank, uh, low, low rank uh, offices. So that, that's our law provides that. That is, even you got a Taiwan citizenship, you are second class of a citizen uh, in Taiwan. And uh, the constitutional court that our Da Fa Guan uh, ruling in interpretation 618 uphold, upheld the law. The reason is that because that the, in, in its opinion, it explained that ex mainland Chinese have a different view as to the constitutional structure of a free democracy. That's the you, you came from the communist country, then you don't know how to exercise your citizenship. And uh, the other reason is Taiwanese don't trust them yet. So the Constitutional Court just endorsed the bias, just ignored the equal citizenship principle, and the humiliating citizens with the mainland origin. Uh, that's the current law. And as if, if we, that, that's, the, that's the status. But the further, we want to make comparison between foreign spouses and mainland spouses. Because the, 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 uh, the 11th Amendment said that we may treat mainland Chinese as foreigners. However, we will see that uh, they, they, they receive the far worse treatment than foreign spouses. For instance, they have longer waiting period to become a citizen. A foreign, citizen, a foreign spouse just need to wait um, at least four years. But they must wait for uh, six years. And uh, deportation because of this minor or crime. Because the foreign spouses will not be expelled unless they, they have been convicted and sentenced to more than one year in prison for intentional crime. However, if you were, you were a mainland spouse, you could be expelled whenever the NIA decides that you committed some crime. And right of association, the foreign spouses have the right to association. And uh, the foreign spouses have the right to assemble in the parade. But uh, mainland spouses, don't have no kind, that kind of right. And uh, even though, the, yes, the, the foreign spouses, uh, after their naturalization, their right to hold a public office, ship, uh, office would be restricted, but uh, only in limited circumstances. Some high rank, some political, uh, uh, political officers, that's uh, very different. And th there are other, other restrictions that we know. The, the concluding remarks that I want to make is that uh, I think that there is a lost concept of equal citizenship in our legal literature and uh, uh, rhetoric. That's the status quo, before transfer, they, uh, those men and spouses uh, just got the worse treatment, worse than foreigners. Uh, even after the transfer, uh, that situation will be worse than naturalized citizens, native-born citizens, and they, without, they are without full-fledged citizenship. In, in my view, the constitutional ideal is equal citizenship. If they were transferred to be a Taiwan citizen, they must be treated as Taiwanese equally. Even before the transfer, uh, even before the transfer, they must be treated like citizens, except the factors absolutely relate to sovereignty, like vote. Equal treatment as the uh, they, they must receive other uh, equal treatment as other immigrants. That is, that they should not be treated less favorably than other foreigners. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that uh, we, we have not discussed that yet. Uh, so I think that this article could be a starting point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, Dr. Lau's paper apparently uh, to be an uh, advocate for the uh, uh, men and Chinese uh, wives' uh, human right. Um, and so apparently uh, it's not quiet in the domestic domain, even, th even though the, the strong cross trade is there, but there's a storm there too. So I hope that we don't have a storm here in, in, in this table, on this table. Um, we we'll have first discussed uh, Dr. Liao Wanying, or Yang Wanying, sorry.
to say I'm very glad to see <coughs> this panel and uh, discuss this paper uh, because this paper is, uh, Professor Freeman's paper is quite interesting and informative in many aspects. And particularly, uh, recently I just published a paper uh, dealing with the, uh, the citizenship dilemma of Chinese spouse. So I think we share a very similar subject interest. And so I'm quite excited and uh, happy to have this chance. And thank you, Professor Wu's invitation uh, to ch exchange ideas here. Uh, I, I personally, uh, in, in this paper, I think I personally agree with that um, uh, many observation and uh, conceptual framework uh, that was uh, raised in this paper. And uh, this research project is quite convincing in terms of its research um, proceedings, its approach and conceptual inference. Uh, Professor Freeman conduct quite a lot of interviews, over 100 pages, well, wow, amazing really. And uh, uh, those interviews, um, they are from different uh, areas in, uh, in China, uh, rural and uh, urban area, different province, and the different socioeconomic status. And they are uh, different generations. And some were born before the 1964, and some were after the 1964. So with my code, some are the uh, so-called the, so, uh, the cultural revolution generation, some multi-reform generations. And um, uh, the scale and the depth, as well as the representativeness of the sampling, I think is quite impressive, which makes it a very grounded analysis. And with such strong empirical basis, as well as updated policy discussion, this paper centers around the dependent, dependent model, which captured the real living experience of most Chinese spouse in Taiwan, who are assigned the domestic and reproductive roles as wife and mother and caregivers. I believe that most of us share with Professor Freeman the same ideas on the observation and models. Uh, however, given this merits of this paper, I want to raise one main question, only one that I think is very critical, uh, which was discussed in this paper, but not fully addressed. Um, as Professor Freeman explained, the dependent model was shaped by the government regulated policy and more importantly, the patriarchal order in Taiwan. Professor Freeman mainly attributed the reason why Chinese spouse are treated as domestic dependent to the gender role disparity across trade. However, the focus on the patriarchal gender order in Taiwan need further substantiation. Generally, I agree that Taiwan and China have different gender regime with a past divided experience. Indeed, to say that Taiwan is more patriarchal than many in China fit our general instinct quite well. Certainly, I will not defend for Taiwan's patriarchy here. And uh, it's not our intention to compete um, Taiwan's men to China's men, and which one is more patriarchal than the other. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to make our respectable um, male um, scholar uncomfortable here, uh, which we <laughs> might write another letter together. <laughs> and anyway, back to the, 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 the paper that uh, I think to compare which side of society is more patriarchal, um, this kind of generalization overlooks the fact that the difference across the street are not only in degrees, but also in times. Uh, and the difference is quite complex and varied. To engage a comparison of gender regime across the street, we might fall into a very big trap. In China, the gender regime have gone through the revolution period, uh, the so-called socialist collective era, and to, uh, to the market reform period. Women's status change along with the interactive dynamic among state multi-social and the cultural norms. Even in the same time period, women's experience in China can never be homogeneous, only to look at the rural and uh, uh, urban area. Likewise in Taiwan, the modernization project and the 1980s women's movement both alter the gender role patterns in numerous ways. Uh, I think most of them we know that uh, a lot of gender roles have been in act over the past two decades. In urban area of Taiwan, patriarchal still exists, but not as strong as it, it, it surface. And so, macro-cultural comparison need to be ver need to be addressed very carefully. It should be context-bounded and historical contingent. It might be quite hasty to infer that Chinese spouse suffered the domestication simply because of Taiwan's patriarchy. If less so, we are 
likely Chinese bots is Taiwanese native bots. Uh, such account ignore the uniqueness of immigrant bots compared to native bots. Know that the experience of Chinese bots in Taiwan now are not only different from their China friend, friends married to Chinese male, but also different from Taiwan's native bots. So uh, let's uh, pre furthermore, even there exists cross-trade difference in terms of gender roles. The causal inference linking the deprivation, the dependence of Chinese spouse to their move from less patriarchal society to a more patriarchal society is still problematic. Uh, this statement then can be applied to any um, immigrants, mar marital immigrants, cross border with different uh, cultural backgrounds. It's like saying it's cultural shock then explain everything. So it looks the um, specific context Chinese spouse face in Taiwan. So um, I, I will I put in another way. We might think that uh, the immigrant, immigrant spouse, uh, the, the, the situation that the Chinese spouse they face in Taiwan actually might be, uh, they fill in the patriarchal vacancy. That was serious challenges in Taiwan's, uh, in native Taiwan's couplehood. So uh, overall, I still consider that the key to why Chinese spouse are treated as domestic dependents cannot be separate from the political context or across the strait. Focusing on only on the gender perspective might lose other important factors in explaining why the dependent variable, dependent model uh, was made possible and changeable. I argue that uh, Chinese spouse citizenship is stratified and they have more social rights and less civic, civic and the political rights. Um, so in addition to the patriarchal explanation, I argue that the dependence of Chinese spouse citizenship is actually buttressed by Taiwan's nationalist view. The political tension across the strait make Taiwanese wife as enemy in the state's eyes. I think uh, Professor Zhao have uh, wrote some paper about this. So uh, for the political tension, uh, political tension are erased, uh, are eased. Their social status, the Chinese spouse social status, actually is improved. So uh, as we all know, know, the TMT maintain a better cross-trade relationship, also revise and the rules, the regulation on um, Chinese spouse citizenship. So patriarchy and the nationalism ideology fit into each other, each other's need, and they support each other. That by depriving the Chinese spouse's political and social citizen rights, the Chinese, the Chinese spouse in Taiwan actually they gain access to enter the individual and the private house via marriage but they cannot enter the state gate. They cannot enter the country gate. So uh, as, a, as a whole, I actually appreciate this paper and I, um, I hope we have further discussion on this subject in the future. And um, uh, that's my major question to this paper. Thank you. Which, which side of men are more patriarchal? Is Taiwanese or Chinese can be debatable and even in China, I think the Beijing people will think, well, well, the Shanghai people will think that Beijing people are very much patriotic because Shanghai men cook every day. They even go shopping uh, before work. Is that true? <laughs> Ling Gang? Not for you. You are, so you are patriarchal. Um, so Beijing people, you are not like us. Uh, just the other day, I tell a story. Uh, the other day, actually, I had lunch with um, the academy function. Uh, one accountant, one uh, law, uh, uh, a research uh, 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 f fellow here, and one linguistics. Three are female. And they talk about Chinese New Year. It's coming up next week, and they talk about the meal preparation for the Lunar New Year. And for them, it's a nightmare for, for their old married, these daughter-in-laws. And they talk about how hardship they have prepared. And the on, on the other hand, they say, those, the sister-in-law, they don't cook. They come home and sit like that. They're like a guest. They have to prepare all meal. Then I ask a question. Your in-laws, your sister-in-law also married to someone else too. Do they, do they enjoy, maybe they come back to have comfort, comfort. And you have to prepare. So they are very happy if they arrange that new year. We're talking, actually we talk about the go away, get away, <laughs> um, the whole family to countryside, the whole, and 
I said that would be uh, very difficult to mobilize whole family, but those uh, uh, women scholars and content said they are very happy if they can go off whole week. They don't have to prepare. On the other hand, it's an, on the, the tradition, on the second day of the new year, um, all daughters are supposed to go back, leave the, the husband's ha home alone, and br br uh, bring his or her husband to the home. But I say, three of them, they say, no, they compromise, because you see, I have to stay there to cook for them, because their, uh, their, the sister-in-law are coming back. But, they, but they, you are also sister-in-law of someone else. But why, why so? So, so this is a puzzle. Then they cannot give me the answers. So what can, we can use the, uh, maybe anthropologists can tell the detail of the ethnographic study. Well, you do that, whether or not. There can be a good indication whether or not these Taiwanese women are sacrificed more during the week. How about the other 360 days? And then we're talking about intergenerational patriarchal power relationship or the husband-wife relationship. That would be interesting for us to examine. Um, they, during lunchtime the other day, I found that we are very, male are very dominant. And they, they, they also mentioned about the father-in-law. One time, one, one, one law professor, she said, just on the table, he said, with all, sis, all the daughter-in-law agree, we will prepare, we will cater. We, for our side, and please, father-in-law, you, you order, we pay, every three daughter-in-law will, uh, will pay for the money. And I said, they are very happy. And the father didn't say anything. So when they return, nothing prepared. So the three daughters in law has to prepare the meal for the whole family. So again, the other generation uh, matters too. So let's leave to, um, to, to, to you to decide whether Taiwanese or Chinese are patriarchal or um, power dominant for the new year alone only. OK. so. Uh, let's invite uh, Chen Zhao Lu, Dr. Chen Zhao Lu to make the second papers come. Thank you. Oh, hi. I'm glad that I have the chance to participate in today's conference and comment on Professor Liao's paper on the legal status of mainland spouses. And I would like to thank Professor Sarah Lindman's invitation. Professor Liao is an expert in the fields of civil rights and immigration law and activist in immigration rights. And I think this paper is a product of his activist scholarship. To facilitate my discussion, I would like to conclude his points here. And the points of his paper are quite simple and clear. Uh, first, under the Constitution and the law and the act governing relationship, relations between people of the Taiwan era and mainland era, that is the Anguan Xi Tiali, mainland Chinese are special citizens who could be legally treated like foreigners. Professor Liao considered it a constitutional endorsement of their second class citizenship status. Second, mainland spouses are a special group of mainland Chinese. Due to their intimate relationship with Taiwanese, the constitution and international human rights law require that they be treated at least like semi-Taiwanese. Third, even though it is legal to treat men and spouses less favorably than Taiwanese, it is unconstitutional to treat them less favorable than foreigners. It is also unconstitutional to treat these men and spouses who are admitted to permanent residency differently from Taiwanese. Fourth, legal regulation of men and spouse under the law is unconstitutional. They enjoy only limited rights. They cannot freely enter the country. They are subject to deportation on certain grounds. They have to wait longer than foreign spouses for citizenship. They enjoy limited right to their Taiwanese spouse's inheritance. Even after they are admitted to permanent residency, they are not entitled to serve public offices for at least 10 years. These different treatments are all violations of the constitutional guarantee of equal protection. And finally, Professor Liao advocates equal citizenship for men and spouses. They must be treated like Taiwanese citizens because they are members of the community. Although Professor Liao and I differ in our views on the interpretation of the constitutional amendments 
and laws that define the relationship between the PRC and ROC. We do share common concerns on the disadvantaged situation of foreign spouses in Taiwan. And here I would like to focus my discussion on two issues. First, the question of equality theory under the Constitution. Second, the question of gender. It seems that Professor Liao adopts a formal equality theory in his interpretation of the Constitution and his assessment of men and spouses' legal status. The formal equality theory requires likes to be treated alike and unlikes to be treated unlike. The key to formal equality theory is the similarity test. Those who are considered the same should be treated the same and vice versa. Men and spouses shall be treated like Taiwanese citizens or at least like foreign spouses. But the laws adopt a false categorization and treat them differently. This is inequality. This interpretation of equality is consistent with the grand justices, Da Fa Guan, who consider equality a question of reasonable or unreasonable different treatment, A comparing theory is substantive equality, which focuses not on similarity test, but on domination and subordination. A simple example may illustrate the difference between the two equality theories. If treating men and spouses like Taiwanese citizens suffice equality, it would be equally illegal for men and spouses and Taiwanese citizens to rally against the government without applying for permission in advance. Yet if the point is the subordinate situation of men and spouses, that is, their ex exclusion from or their marginalization in the political community, simply treating, Taiwanese, simply treating men and spouses like Taiwanese citizens will be an improvement, but will not suffice equality. My second question has to do with the gender of men and spouses. As Professor Sarah Freeman has pointed out in her paper, most men and spouses are wives of Taiwanese male citizens. And she has also successfully argued that marital immigration policies and patriarchal norms together create a dependent model that channels Chinese spouses into reproductive roles. Although I do share with Professor Yang's concern that it would be problematic to compare the degree of patriarchy be, uh, between Taiwanese society and Chinese society, I do think that should make an important point that is um, the marriage Im immigration in Taiwan is a phenomenon of gender inequality. And although Professor Liao does mention about gender discrimination in the beginning of his paper, he does not elaborate on this and discuss the legal status of men and spouses, men mostly in a gender neutral fashion. Yet if we take gender into account, the migration of men and spouses of Taiwanese men to Taiwan is obviously a practice of the patrilineal norm that a wife shall follow her husband and marry into his family. There might be various reasons for her decision to follow her husband. And to treat them simply as victims of human trafficking may underestimate their agency. But it is an undeniable fact that it is mostly women who move across borders due to marriage. Will treating men and spouses like Taiwanese citizens change this pattern and their dependent status? On average, women earn less than men. It is women who do most of the housework. We're treating men and wives like Taiwanese wives, grant them equal, equal pay and equal division of labor. If men and spouses are channeled into reproducers and caretakers for Taiwanese men and his family, what can be done to change it? The revision of the Nationality Act in 2000 abolished the doctrine of mandatory marital naturalization and adopted a gender-neutral 
principle so as to equalize women's relationship with the nation as men's. It has been 10 years since the new law took effect, and foreign spouses' subordinate status remains. This brings us back to the equality question. Will formal equality theory produce real equality, or will it work more to maintain gender e inequality than to change it? These are my comments, and I look forward to further discussion on the issue of equality. Thank you. Many uh, legal talking, uh, <laughs> but I'm sure many substance. Um, I try to I listen very hard to, to get it, but I do know they're different. Um, okay, so we will have the, the final uh, discussion, which I said it, grand discussion. So that means uh, Dr. Zhao will make a comment on both papers, right? Okay, please. Thank you. Um, well, actually, I'm not going to make any comments on the, the other two discussions. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> to make comments, um, some response to the first two papers. But first of all, um, uh, I must say that uh, it is my true honor to be invited by Sarah to participate in this um, great panel. Um, well, because uh, to my mind, the greatness of the panel derives partly from the fact that normally we do not encounter any academic conference here in Taiwan and very likely elsewhere devoting any panels that attend exclusively to the uh, citizen rights and their limitations imposed upon Chinese spouses. <coughs> um, well, even though research of foreign spouses taking long-term residence in Taiwan has been increasingly popular since mid-2000s, the majority of researchers focus on subjects uh, originally from Southeast Asia with a specific interest in issues such as birthing, race, maternal obligations, or the ensuing burdens, familial arrangements in the natal households, and the conditions of and or limitations to cultural assimilations. Obviously, the reproductive and the caretaking model, or the uh, dependent model, as Sarah demonstrates in her paper, applies as well to the subjects of uh, the so-called foreign spouses, that is, the Southeast spouses, um, and uh, Southeast Asian spouses, I'm sorry, and is arguably taken more often as a given fact by researchers in that area. But the fact that Chinese spouses are largely left out from academic discussions of marriage migrants may be partly attributed to the state sovereignty reasoning as Bruce Liao um, traces in her paper, as well as to the rapidly changing political economic relationships towards the Taiwan Strait, which has produced widespread, widespread ambivalent feelings about the PRC that can easily be projected onto the Chinese spouses who are suspiciously, uh, who are suspicious of uh, innately lacking Taiwanese domestic and patrilineal concerns and or capabilities. <coughs> As both Sarah and Bruce have shown <coughs> meticulously to us, therefore, not only are mainland spouses forced to face conditions of legal rights fundamentally distinct from both their foreign counterparts and the so-called natural-born Taiwanese citizens, such varied conditions are closely interlinked with how a nation, in particular, a nation has long conceived itself to be under multiple life and death threats, so to speak, understands, constructs, and intends to reconstruct its cultural contours in the post 40s global community. And following the shared concern of this panel with the law and the citizens' rights, I only wish to add that on how the law is practiced and understood and uh, interpreted uh, by um, the lawmakers um, and immigration agents uh, is also quite in important, which may um, um, affect largely uh, than the law itself uh, in the everyday life practice um, of mainland spouses and their family members. And so I'm really um, um, curious how Professor Liao would say um, something about that. <coughs> um, then as an anthropologist by training, I'm um, actually having um, 
much more intimate feeling towards various papers, which certainly is not to deny at all the merits of those contributions, I should say, sorry. And so uh, um, for the rest of time, I will just um, point out several points uh, in Sarah's paper that um, make me especially interested, and I'm really hoping that Sarah would say something about that, about them. Um, my first point is um, on page four, um, Sarah says, Chinese spouses in Taiwan bear striking similarities to disadvantaged women workers in other parts of the world whose daily lives and economic opportunities have been shaped by the dictate of the post 40s global economy. And then following Maria Mies and uh, uh, Chandra Mohanty, she, she characterizes these types of work as a care-based, domesticized, emotional, and reproductive. Well, that is uh, feminized by both the transnational and the Taiwanese standards. So, um, well, um, to my mind, it's really an insightful point to um, uh, trying to uh, bring together uh, uh, this um, uh, seemingly divergent um, um, uh, researches um, 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 and the transnational uh, comparison of uh, uh, men and spouses in Taiwan and uh, uh, workers, uh, especially disadvantaged uh, women workers uh, in the third world. Um, I'm just wondering. Um, uh, uh, I'm just wondering from um, a theoretical perspective, what we can go more deeper uh, about uh, the linkage between uh, a global uh, perspective um, um, uh, or universal perspective on disadvantaged um, um, women workers or uh, women lives and the local conditions in Taiwan. Um, and also, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering why uh, Sarah um, left out sex workers or sex work um, from this picture. Uh, because uh, to my mind, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Sarah knows that as well, knows that very, sure, uh, uh, very well as well. Uh, that is, um, um, sex work or semi-sex work um, is uh, um, one of the uh, jobs, a uh, few jobs, um, or for uh, one of the few work, uh, types of work, uh, men and spouses um, uh, are allowed or welcome to take up in Taiwan. Uh, but in the whole paper, uh, we see a lot of discussion about the gender politics, but uh, very, very few um, uh, mentioning of sexuality. And so I'm really interested in, in the possible uh, linkage between gender and the sexuality uh, in uh, examining the disadvantage um, uh, um, uh, life conditions of uh, uh, men and women in Taiwan. So uh, this is my uh, first point. Okay, and then my um, second question is, um, it's not really a question, it's uh, more like um, a reflection um, for sort. So um, uh, my second point is on page 14, and Sarah mentioned that, um, well actually she, she also pointed out that um, toward the end of her uh, presentation uh, in the beginning of this panel, which is um, she said, uh, I was uh, struck by the consistently, uh, I was struck consistently by their uh, family composition operations in both Taiwan and China deviate from the idealized vision portrayed in the map MAC uh, video. Mm. Um, what I'm, I'm wondering, what is, yes, it's, um, it's a very interesting point, and also uh, it's uh, um, what Sarah has pointed out uh, conforms to what my research over the past 10 years uh, has, um, uh, has shown. And so I think that's indeed the kind of a fact um, uh, the um, men and spouses in Taiwan have to face. Um, but uh, I'm just wondering um, what's really the, uh, the most um, mm, appropriate theoretical implication of uh, this finding. Um, I'm, 
Uh, and I'm thinking that um, maybe um, um, it also um, uh, shows that um, the so-called family um, family model or the patrilineal um, family model or patrilineal kinship model model as we anthropologists love to use um, should be uh, fundamentally problematized as well, right? Uh, especially in the age of uh, globalization and also especially uh, in the case of a transnational migration. Uh, so um, um, I'm just wondering what um, uh, Sarah would say about that. Um, then my third point is um, mm, having something to do with that uh, uh, patriarchal debate, um, um, patriarchal thing uh, regarding uh, Chinese men and Taiwanese men, mm, but with a different concern. So um, uh, just, uh, on page 17, Sarah says, uh, the ir irony here is that many women initially imagined marriage to Taiwanese as liberating from some of the economic and gender constraints they face in China, but they soon discover that they are expected to fulfill similar and possibly even more domesticated rules in Taiwan. Um, so, um, mm, uh, and then uh, from page 21 to 25, and she uh, cites a lot of ethnographic accounts uh, to, uh, to sort of uh, highlight uh, the subject of this session that is men and men treasure their wives. Well, for example, uh, one uh, informant said, before I, uh, well, before I came here, I came to Taiwan, uh, meaning uh, uh, when I uh, was in China back then, I had relatives, friends, my own income. Now, however, I feel as if I am a useless person. This is on page 22. And on page 23, uh, one informant said, oh, they, meaning uh, Taiwanese men, all Taiwanese men, are all like that. Like what? Frankly speaking, men from here are extremely patriarchal. By contrast of this person, this same informant, added that men and men are more likely to be considerate of their wives and so on and so forth. Um, so, um, um, the interest in is not really making comparison of uh, these two counterparts, if there are indeed two counterparts, well, which I doubt um, uh, this is Sarah's intention at all uh, in the paper. Um, but the interest in uh, is a quite different um, um, thing. Well, that is, if, if we make a comparison um, uh, uh, between uh, men and spouses and uh, women uh, who are, Chinese women who are, engage in sham or so-called fraud marriage, uh, and especially those who are engaged in sex work. And then we will find completely opposite comments. Oh. And my uh, informants um, who are engaged in sham marriage and who are taking up uh, sex work uh, as a, a way of uh, life in Taiwan, and would say um, uh, things like, uh, uh, all Taiwanese men are very nice and uh, gentle and nurturing, and uh, they pay me all sorts of uh, <laughs> gifts, and uh, they support me, and they even support my family members in China, and uh, they even support my sons and my children, my kids and my fathers, my parents uh, back in China. And uh, um, <laughs> uh, if I would have a chance um, to uh, 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 acquire full citizenship of Taiwan, and I would leave my fraud husband and of course, and then marry them, marry one of them, and so on and so forth. And, and of course, then they would make a concluding remark like uh, uh, Taiwanese men uh, are the true egalitarian and nice and um, whatever uh, gentle uh, uh, human beings on the surface of the world. Uh, of the world. And uh, in contrast to Taiwanese men, and Chinese men are just jerks. Oh, sorry. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's, that's what they said. So I'm just curious. <laughs> Why there, there there is such a divergent views shared by uh, two groups of people? Uh, what's really implication? What's the possible implication of that? Uh, for example, does that imply that um, the uh, the institution of a heterosexual marriage itself is um, fundamentally, you know, 
restrictive <laughs> and horrible and whatever. And so um, uh, only when you are uh, 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 pretending uh, to be a marriage partner, the way that is engaging in uh, sham marriage and, uh, 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 and especially engaging in sex work, and then well, that is engaging in multiple uh, sex lives. And then you would be um, acquiring, uh, I don't know, fantasmatic uh, freedom. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know. Okay, thank you. Well, you just bring in the question again, so the debate continues. Um, okay, we have a question uh, session. We will entertain a few questions. But one minute, identify yourself first, even though it's 12.30, Dr. Wu. I, I enjoy this panel uh, very much. I think we are actually talking about like three issues. The first one is gender discrimination against women. The second one is ethnic discrimination against aliens. The third one is cross-strait antagonism against a potential enemy. And probably the male and spouses are in, as um, Professor Liao Yanhao said, in a worse situation because they are suffering from all the three discriminations, gender, ethnic, and cross-strait. Whether it is an ethnic discrimination, it really depends on the person who um, probably abuse their spouse, uh, how they view the, um, uh, the nationality or ethnic origin of the spouse. Um, I'm curious to know if you are very much against gender discrimination and you are against ethnic discrimination, but then you sincerely f feel that uh, there is hostility coming from the other side of the street and, and you, you cannot deny that and there is this potential threat of military uh, invasion from mainland China. If you sincerely think that's the case, then how would you deal with this situation? Um, I think this is a puzzle for even some of the um, scholars, um, and, and it has to be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I apologize in advance for making the bell go off, but in my defense, I've been fairly quiet so far. <laughs> uh, my question's for Sarah, and first, thank you. I thought that was a really interesting and, and rich paper, and thank you to the discussants, too, who I thought added a lot, and, and um, I think I'm really just following up on Professor Yang's discussion, although you can tell me I got it wrong if you want, but she suggested at the end of her discussion that maybe, I think it would go for the first session this morning too, maybe cause and effect were being reversed here. That is, it's not that patrilineal ideology is driving behavior, but um, for other reasons, patrilineal ideology is being deployed in certain circumstances. And, and uh, the way I'd like to follow through is suggesting or asking what would happen if we ask the question that way. What are the circumstances in which this particular vision of gender relationships or family relationships um, is deployed. So thinking of the issue that came up in the first session and again in Sarah's paper, just relations with the woman's relatives, right, the ones in Vietnam, the ones in mainland China, whatever, uh, obviously that's a problem um, traditional studies of rural Taiwanese and Chinese kinship have dealt with anyway. It's a patrilineal problem. Um, and you know, what are the different discourses? We have the patrilineal one where in theory the woman leaves behind all those relatives and, but we know she really doesn't and thus there's all this tension in the relationship. We have a nuclear family ideology that people would mobilize under some circumstances. That is, those people just become irrelevant as do the husband's relatives too. We start over, there it goes. Uh, <laughs> and we have a third one, let's call it bilateral, which is, has been an increasingly important direction, I think, both in Taiwan and in China, where all the relatives matter equally on both sides. And apparently, these same Taiwanese men, who I bet when they get in trouble for beating their Vietnamese wives, um, those are the very ones talking to the sex workers, uh, um, you know, and taking care of their families and being the nicest guys in the world. That is to say, I think the implication of Professor Young's question is not even just what she said, which is, you know, it's not Taiwan patriarchy versus mainland patriarchy, and she, say, she suggested urban, rural, class, all these other things, but maybe within every man, these different discourses are available, and the question is, when is each one deployed? Um, it's very quick, and I, I 
enjoyed and learned a lot from both papers, and I, I want to read them carefully now. Um, um, the question that you may address, Sarah, but uh, since I haven't read the paper, I don't know. Um, I'd just like to know more about uh, the profiles of um, the, the groups here. Um, who in, on this side, uh, which, what kinds of men and for what reasons are seeking uh, um, uh, people to marry from the other side of the, the Taiwan Strait, and who are the, the brides? Um, where do they come from? Is, uh, how much generalization uh, is available to us here? It would seem to me to be at a really interesting uh, possible dimension. I'm also interested um, in the, the process. Uh, of uh, how do they get to know one another? Uh, how it, does courtship work? Uh, uh, how sham are these um, marriages? Um, uh, uh, I'm sure there's a real continuum. Um, those are just questions I, I have. Uh, for your paper, uh, Bruce, I, I was um, very interested uh, as I was thinking about what you were talking about uh, uh, in the comparative question of how might uh, this look from the other side. The same process. Uh, that is, uh, uh, people moving to China, um, uh, how are they received? Uh, how does the law handle them? Um, uh, that's a huge question, I'm sure, um, but it, it, ra it was raised for me by your, your talk. Thank you. My question is very short uh, for Yang Hao and Bruce. Uh, I understand that uh, you derive from this ROC constitution and what it says and what amendments said and what the act to the cross-trade relations that says. So, so there's a derivation, derivative kind of a analysis. Uh, but the, I, just, just for an idea, I, I know you mentioned many times in your presentation, you said literally, 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 so that's what the constitution says, you mean. Uh, okay. Uh, but what's, what do you think beyond being a legal scholar, do you think we really sh should, uh, are we still obliged to the 1945 Constitution's uh, territorial sense? Is that sensible or is it real? Do you really believe that? Um, if you don't see other hands, we will just stop here with question and answer. Uh, we will, uh, our, our first speaker will give three minutes at most, maximum of the response. Three minutes, daunting. Okay, um, I think I can re actually respond to several of the excellent comments and questions with a statement that I imagine comes out of um, the fact that this is a very rough paper and I didn't do the kind of analytic work I needed to do to make this point stronger. I, I did not have any intention to empirically compare patriarchy in China as, as opposed to Taiwan and to weigh it that way. And I think, um, as both Antonia and, and Rob said, what I'm really interested in is how gender gets mobilized discursively in particular contexts and the work that it does in those contexts to deflect attention to other issues or to address them through a terrain that in some ways is more ex socially acceptable, possibly. Um, I, I think both Antonia, all of the comments, and Rob, and everyone is asking me this question of what is the consequences of that, and that, that's certainly something I need to think about much, much more. But um, I, I did not, not intend to make a, a sort of empirical balancing question. I, I do want to also just briefly um, mention uh, the point um, Antonia was making about, about sexuality, why is sexuality left out of here? Um, and, and why might, um, at how might that figure in to um, a, a, a global, a more global perspective that would enable us to think about women workers migrating to different parts of the world um, as well as women who are migrating as spouses. And I think one of the things I was trying to do there is um, bridge, working with other people to bridge that perceived gap between a migrant worker and a migrant spouse. And in fact, to say that there are various kinds of motivations 
um, for people moving across borders, and that if we just if we keep family reunification and labor as completely separate categories, we're missing actually a lot of the continuities across those categories. Um, obviously, I, I need to do a lot more work here to to flesh that out. Um, the, the specific sexuality part of it, I think, is really interesting, and it, it isn't in here, um, and it's something I need to think about more. Um, Antonia has done a lot more work on this and has, has done some very, um, very, very nuanced analyses of this and has had much more access to people who are in openly sham marriages than I have. Um, but I think it's interesting how they mobilize in, in precisely the opposite way, right, which shows me that gender is really and is really important here, and it's not that it's the specifics of what they're saying, but it's how they're saying and why they're saying it and in what context, what work it's doing precisely. Um, and, and, and that's where I, I hope to move this paper in, in for future revisions and to think about it more. Um, and Tim, in response to your question, I'll, that, that requires a pretty significant, so I, I'll hold off on that one. But thank you all. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, what Professor John Mogu raised is exactly what I meant to get rid of it. <laughs> because I, I think that, uh, yes, that the, the reason for the mainland Chinese spouses to be discriminated against uh, is just uh, the, uh, it, because in Taiwan it's very hard to reach the consensus as the perception of the cross relationship, a cross trade relationship. So my point as a, uh, uh, my, my point is that if you think of Taiwan and China as one country, they are our citizens. If you think of a Taiwan and uh, mainland China are different, totally independent countries, then they should be treated as foreigners. Anyway, either way, they should not be treated as the, the, the second class immigrants. Uh, that, that's my point, because it's very hard to persuade it, the, the different camps of the, in Taiwan. And uh, 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 as mentioned in, in Zhao Ru's comment, I, I think that the, because I, I wrote this article in terms of some strategic and premised concern, uh, why I used the, the so-called formal equality approach. In, uh, as a theorist, uh, I oppose the uh, so-called formal equality approach. However, I, I think that I sh sometimes I should play their games. For instance, their rhetoric, the, their means government or some policymakers, the rhetoric is that the mainland spouses are different, so we can treat them differently. Or more precisely, uh, because they are worse, so we can treat them worse. However, uh, my argument is that because they are not that different, they are similar to us or similar to foreign spouses. So at least we, can, we should treat them not less than, favorably than foreigners or, or Taiwanese. That's, that, that's my point, and uh, that's the strategy, strategic concern. The other uh, uh, the other point I want to say, but not revealed in this article fully, is that basically my argument is different from so-called formal equality. My theory is equal, about the equal citizenship. We, we know that the equal citizenship is different from the traditional so-called individual rights or human rights approach. I think individual rights or human rights approach, sometimes it will be disaster for immigrants to advocate their rights. Why? Because individual or rights or human rights approach put much emphasis on isolation. That is, I'm an individual. I'm an individual where I have a right to be free from the state. I want to have an enclave to be free, uh, to against the state or against the community. So the traditional individual right to rhetoric has the uh, potential to isolate the individual and the community. However, equal citizenship will put much emphasis on the something very essential to the membership of the community. That is, when I claim equal citizenship, I don't want to be free from the government or free from the community only. I want to be recognized by this community. And I think that's what the, many immigrants want to say. Uh, they, they, like those main, uh, mainland spouses, they want to say, I'm the member of the Taiwan community, whatever you call it, ROC, Taiwan, or, or so-called uh, China. Whether you define it, whether you call it, I am the member of this community of Taiwan, and that's what I want to advocate. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> I think time is up, and we should stop here. Um, uh, 
this, this session, I think, provides us a very interesting and, and open the door to see the human aspect of the, um, the cross-strait relations uh, politically. And that, uh, again, we see also politics, too. Um, and the other thing we have not talked about is, I think, maybe interesting to compare the two different generations. One is Manlander, men and men who came to Taiwan 60 years ago, who married to Taiwanese women a lot, compared to now, 20 years, since 20 years ago, that a man and woman married to a Taiwanese man. So how they, how they these two generations differ and with different uh, agenda. So that will be interesting for us to compare. And plus, the reason, the reason we talk about men and women married to Taiwan, men living in Taiwan, how about a Taiwanese man married to a man and woman living in China? Uh, how do they treat each other? And whether that power is deferred because of men there doing business, so economically more powerful rather than this way. So that will be interesting for us to examine. Um, so I think we we'll open many doors, not only one door and windows too. So now we should go to lunch. And thank you very much for joining us and to, to give a hand to the two speakers and three discussants.